Hello, everyone. My name is Tobias Cropper. I am a project manager here at the Beinecke Library. It is my pleasure today to introduce Dr. Jason Miller, professor of literature from North Carolina State University. Dr. Miller's research revolves around American poetry and literature. Amongst his, re we, uh, amongst his research, I'm sorry, includes diving deeper into the lives and relationships of the great Dr. Martin Luther King and the timely and timeless poet Langston Hughes. This project, when MLK and the KKK met in Raleigh, documents the KKK's march down Fayetteville Street on the day Dr. King spoke in Reynolds Coliseum in July 31st, 1966. Never before developed photos have been digitized from the original negatives and are now permanently available on view in the Isle Pearl Museum Immersion Theater at Hunt's Library and were first displayed at the African American Culture Center. His previous book, Origins of the Dream, Hughes' Poetry and King's Rhetoric, traces MLK's use of Hughes' poetry in his sermons from 1956 to 68. His other project, King's First Dream, made the first ever recording of MLK's I Have a Dream speech available online at kingsfirstdream.com. His earlier book, Langston Hughes and the American Lynching Culture, investigates the nearly three dozen poems by Hughes to show the complex relationship between politics, culture, and art. His many projects have received much deserved coverage from a multitude of outlets, from NPR to CNN to ABC, CBS, and many more local and global media outlets. Dr. Miller has spent a great portion of his life dedicating his work to revealing greater truths in American literature and history. His biography on Langston Hughes is now available from the United St uh, um, sorry, University of Chicago Press. It draws on unpublished letters and manuscripts by Hughes. Dr. Miller addresses Hughes' often ignored contributions to the civil rights movement of the 1960s and repositions him as a writer rather than merely the beloved African-American poet of the 20th century. Most recently, he's been featured in today's New York's Daily News with his article titled, How the FBI Treated Him, Revisiting a Painful Historical Double Standard, where he draws on the way the FBI treated Dr. King and how it sharply contrasts against the white supremacists today. As always, feel free to place your questions in the Q&A section as we will go back at the end of his lecture to answer any questions anyone may have. But without further ado, I present to you, Dr. Jason Miller. Thank you so much. It's a real honor to be here. No institution has done more for the life and legacy of Langston Hughes than the Beinecke Library. And so this opportunity is one small way in which we might see the full circle returning from what Hughes did to what the Beinecke has restored and covered and cached for history and how it makes its way into our new understandings of Hughes's influence. One thing we might not be aware of when we consider Dr. King and Langston Hughes is that there could possibly be more to uncover. But to begin with, we realized that just 12 short months ago, we learned that we had Langston Hughes' birth year wrong for his entire lifetime and beyond. We now know he was born in the year 1901, not 1902 as we had previously believed um, up until recently. I ask you to be as open to thinking about Dr. King in a new way as well. It can be very difficult when we have two essential American icons that we know so well to believe that we might have missed something. Dr. King really knew how to work an audience. When he delivered his first ever I Have a Dream speech in Rocky Mount, North Carolina on November 27, 1962, nine months before the March on Washington, he opened by describing a very bumpy plane ride he'd taken from Atlanta to Raleigh. He told his audience that he was glad to land. It was a bit dicey up in the air. And seeing the anguish in their faces, he immediately turned to calm them by saying, I don't want to give you the wrong impression. It's not that I don't have faith in God in the air. It's simply I've had more experience with him on the ground. 
Today, I'll be showing you several images from the Beinecke Library, which tell a larger story about the connection between the great Dr. Martin Luther King and the poet writer Langston Hughes. Dr. King used no less than seven poems by Langston Hughes. Over the course of his lifetime, these poems include things like Dream Deferred, Youth, Let America Be America Again, Brotherly Love, I Dream a World, Mother to Son, and a poem you've likely never heard of because it has not been published, but it was requested specially by Dr. King from Langston Hughes, Poem for a Man. To be clear, Langston Hughes's poetry hovers behind Dr. King's metaphors like a watermark on bonded paper. We might ask ourselves, why have we missed these connections? And we would have two succinct answers. Number one, scholars have not brought a literary lens to understanding Dr. King's use of poetry. Although he finished in the bottom one third on his GRE exams in every category except one, that one being literature in which he scored the highest in the lower 67th percentile, no one thought to think about what Dr. King was reading. In my eight years of research and preparing for the book, I was able to uncover that Dr. King was reading the poetry of Emily Dickinson and Robert Frost while he was flying around the country. But the poet that he seemed drawn to most personally, that is poems in which he personally sought out rather than simply writing down when others spoke, includes the poetry of Langston Hughes, his wife Coretta's favorite poet, a person for whom she owned every single book that Langston Hughes wrote. Of those seven poems, I wanna focus in on three in the wonderful time we have together. They all focus around Langston Hughes' essential metaphor of dreaming. Many of you are well aware of Langston Hughes' most famous poem. When it was published in 1951, it came under the title of um, the idea of not only what happens to a dream deferred, but it was originally titled Harlem. Over the years, when Hughes republished it, it became Dream Deferred. And what you're looking at on your screen is the original handwritten version of that poem as held at the Beinecke Library. We have a variety of people listening in, and so we'll recognize right away that these staple marks on the top are where the poem continued to be linked to the typed versions of the drafts that followed. We'll see the long piece of paper under memorandum. We'll see that Hughes seemed quite pleased at what he had written by making a star and a circle, as if to say, this is really good. And here's what he wrote on August 7th, 1948, approximately three weeks into his first uh, home that he would co-own on the famous street in Harlem. He wrote, does it dry up like a raisin in the sun? Does it fester like a sore than run? Does it stink like rotten meat or crust and sugar over like a syrupy sweet? Or does it atom like explode and leave deaths in its wake? There are a number of startling things here. We are surprised to find Langston Hughes actually has nuclear explosions and warfare on his mind when he comes up with a final metaphor that will be succinctly truncated to be more ambiguous to simply, or does it explode? We find also something really startling as we look at the word fester. Hughes's hand actually went to start to write the letters R, O, and T. And after months of looking at this word, I came to think that Langston Hughes actually begins this poem where the famous version by Billie Holiday of Strange Fruit ends. You may remember the final stanza of that song, here is fruit for the sun to rot. When Langston Hughes asks, does it dry up like a raisin in the sun? And then immediately moves to, does it rot? He seems to be asking what has happened to our dreams and hopes. Where the body was once lynched, is it possible that our hopes and dreams are being lynched? Now, why I have this picture of Dr. King next to this famous poem is simple. Dr. King started using this poem in his sermons and speeches on exactly April 5th of 1959. Now, I have a 14 foot 
long, three foot tall timeline that documents every single incident in which Langton Hughes and Dr. King overlap in terms of meeting, letters, or usage. I was confused about why Dr. King had not invoked this poem in his sermons until 1959. Famous and on the scene in 1956, the poem has been in circulation. Fortunately, with the help of a number of graduate students, I set them to work. I said, look at every single newspaper Dr. King took in March and April, specifically the New York Times and the Montgomery Advertiser, two papers we know he read daily. And what we found is when Dr. King returned to India, he had a Palm Sunday sermon he had to deliver. Then he had a Sunday Easter sermon he had to deliver. But the first free Sunday available, he penned a new sermon. And he said as his thesis statement, who here today has not been the victim of blasted hopes and shattered dreams? This was in the wake of the immediate runaway success of the play, A Raisin in the Sun. Lorraine Hansberry's work that took its title from Hughes's poem had debuted only weeks earlier on March 19th. And in review after review of the play, we saw critics refer to it as simply dramatizing Hughes's poem and giving us an image of the younger family and their shattered dreams. Dr. King immediately recognized the importance of this poem as a cultural event, and he started invoking it in his sermons well before things became prophetic or even political. 1959, Dr. King is talking about dreams deferred in his sermons and speeches. And he continues to use these. As you look at another image of Langston Hughes's handwritten amendments and alterations to his poem, you'll see that when Dr. King was writing in the Chicago Defender, he starts quoting Langston Hughes and referencing what happens in A Raisin in the Sun. And this poem became central to how Dr. King would eventually form and shape his dream. Now let's pause here quickly and explain one other thing. I said earlier that no one has thought about Dr. King's literary sources. That's important to why this history has been uncovered until recently. More importantly is this fact, and I'm not going to save it for later. The key reason we've not recognized Dr. King's use of Langston Hughes's poetry is that it disappears from King's rhetoric from exactly April of 1960 to March of 1965. This is because that is the moment in time when Dr. King is under the greatest FBI scrutiny and Langston Hughes has earned the reputation of a communist subversive. This pressure on Dr. King forced him to part way with a number of allies in his closest circle, not the least being his closest advisor, Stanley Levinson. When the FBI, through JFK himself, told Dr. King they could, that JFK could not support civil rights legislation so long as King was friends with people like Stanley Levinson and Jack O'Dell, King could not share letters, see in person, or talk directly for that person for over a year. So, what I did is I charted all of Dr. King's use of Langston Hughes' poems before that window and after, and what we discover is that although Langston Hughes' name becomes absent during that window when he is most in our public imagination, his themes and metaphors are still included in his works. Many of you know Dr. King and Langston Hughes well, but you may not have known that Langston Hughes was this cool. You're looking at an image from October of 1959 of Langston Hughes selling Smirnoff vodka in Ebony Magazine. It is difficult to imagine how important this image was. Even subscription rates of the Times don't tell the full story because a magazine like Ebony would have sat in doctor's offices and beauty salons and dentist offices for up to a month and months afterwards, read sometimes daily by those that came. This happened because Langston Hughes got a great deal of recognition from the success of A Raisin in the Sun. In fact, Langston Hughes would never be more popular than he was in 1960. Briefly, he'd won the NAACP's highest award. A Raisin in the Sun seemed to simply dramatize his works. And equally important, his selected poems came out just right before that year, giving him greater and greater admiration. With this kind of visibility in 1960, Langston Hughes started receiving amazing requests. Here's one. I'm not gonna read this letter, 
But this letter asks if Langston Hughes would consider writing a poem for a very special occasion to take place in January of 1960. Would he celebrate the life of A. Philip Randolph as a celebration at Carnegie Hall was going to take place free and open to the public? The letter writer at the end puts in a very personal note. As you can see before you on the screen, the letter writer states, to add a personal note, my admiration for your works is not only expressed in my personal conversations, but I can no longer count the number of times and places all over the nation in my addresses and sermons in which I have read your poems. I know of no better way to express in beauty the heartbeat and struggle of our people. The signature below is that of Martin Luther King. The connection between these two men was known wholly between them during their lifetimes. It was no secret. It was spoken. It was written. It was documented. And Langston Hughes will make note of it in several other letters he writes to people such as famous stage actor Frederick O'Neill. But this has been lost to us because we don't think of poetry being as political as it was in the hands of Dr. King. So what happens is this poem had never been published before. Langston Hughes is quite proud of the fact that it's been requested from Martin Luther King, as we used to do when we wrote checks to people and we didn't realize the new year had changed. Langston Hughes accidentally mistyped 1959 because that's the year in which he is typing this, but the event takes place January 24th, 1959. And what happens is Langston Hughes has written a poem about A. Philip Randolph that highlights the fact that he has been a dreamer. On that occasion, Dr. King praised A. Philip Randolph as someone who has had the capacity to dream when others had not. And later during the program, Langston Hughes's poem was then read by Ruby D. Langston Hughes knew it was too politically dangerous for him to be there personally, so he did not show up. But what he did is he noted, as everyone did for years after, that Dr. King seemed to talk about the idea of dreaming in anticipation of Hughes's poem as if he had brought the motion to the table when in reality he had merely seconded the motion. So this poem in 1960 shows Dr. King using Langston Hughes's words again when he speaks and talks. So now we ask ourselves, where are we? If we're a scholar, we know this is signifying. Signifying is to repeat with a difference. The repetition honors the past, the difference animates it and injects the creativity of the speaker at the moment. If we're a teacher or former teacher, we call this an illusion. You take the words and you don't reference them directly, you simply use them. If you're a fan of jazz music, you know this concept quite well as riffing, but if you live in our world that we have before us today, you'd have to call this sampling. Dr. King's greatest act of signifying, alluding, riffing, or sampling would take place, however, in the difference of the dates between August 11th, 1956 and November 27th, 1962. Here is Langston Hughes's most popular poem during his lifetime, one that he ended his readings with, and one in which we ask ourselves, how is this not in some way anticipating Dr. King's dream, if not overtly used? What I want you to do is I want you to look at these words one more time, but I want you to think about them in the context of their repetition of anaphora, the phrase, I dream a world repeated. I want you to think about them in terms of their themes. And I'm going to tell you that this poem serves as the third point of connection earlier than anybody had ever imagined between Dr. King's dream and Langston Hughes's poem. Here is Langston Hughes's I Dream a World. On the other side, I'll talk about the connection between the two. Thank you. 
On August 11th, 1956, scholars had long documented that Dr. King's dream had its roots in a speech he delivered in Buffalo. What was startling to me is that Dr. King's vision at that moment did not rely upon the metaphor of dreaming. Instead, it made use of the metaphor of a new world. Dr. King said we need a new world in which, a new world in which, and he used the cadence exactly four times, mimicking Hughes' poem itself. When I retyped Dr. King's speech as if its ending were a poem, I compared it line for line with Langston Hughes' poem, I Dream a World, and saw that Dr. King had rewritten each line, image by image, line by line, but focusing on the idea of a new world, not on the dream. So here's what I had. Dr. King had invoked Langston Hughes' poetry throughout his life. Dr. King had interacted with I Dream a World as early as 1956, and I had the March on Washington speech, August 28th, 1963, but I kept asking myself, there has to be a version in between here. There has to be a moment where Dr. King revisits these ideas and claims the idea of dreaming. And lo and behold, after several visits to the Beinecke Library and other places around the country, I found the most startling bit of evidence less than an hour from where I live and work. It was tucked away in an attic for 38 years. It was a reel to reel tape of Dr. King delivering his first ever I Have a Dream speech recorded by a teacher and it was sitting there and it took six weeks for me to uncover it. And because it's so close, I now have an amazing amount of evidence for what happened on that day and how it affected visitors. But here's what happened. Before the March on Washington, Dr. King visited that exact speech from 1956 and he rewrote the ending. Rather than talking about a new world, now he talked about his new dream in part because he was simultaneously rewriting a chapter, chapter 10 of his book of sermons, Strength to Love, in which he was rewriting the sermon about dream deferred and blasted hopes and shattered dreams. And on a yellow legal pad in green ink, Dr. King literally wrote the line, we as a people have long dreamed of freedom. And he traced over the word dream seven or eight times like an elementary school student who can't pay attention in math class. Dreaming is literally the metaphor he can't get past on the page, and as such, he knows exactly where to put it as he revises an old speech. Nine months before the March on Washington, Dr. King said this, on the other side, I'll wrap things up and we'll turn our attention to questions. November 27th, 1962, Martin Luther King's first ever I Have a Dream speech.
As music uses rests, language sometimes speaks best through silence. It is very hard to follow up Dr. King's words other than to try to summarize these important facts. Langston Hughes's poetry is as significant to the civil rights movement of the 1960s as it was to the Harlem Renaissance. When we consider Dr. King's imaginative and creative use in which he re-energized and reanimated Langston Hughes's works, we realize that his dream was as poetic as it was prophetic or politic. Now to be very specific, Dr. King invoked Langston Hughes's poems on August 11th, 1956, on April 5th, 1959, and on January 24th, 1960. It would only be in October of 1960 that he ever started talking about the American dream, and it would not be until late 1962 that he put his dream in the context of prophecy. It's been my honor to speak with you as we move to questions and answers. I think what we've seen is that Dr. King became the star performer of some of Langston Hughes's greatest scripts. Thank you very much.